the New Testament survey, lesson number one, and we just finished the Old Testament survey, Genesis through Malachi. Uh, Old Testament's got 39 books. You can keep up with that by Old Testament, old three uh, letters. Testament has nine, it's 39. Well, in the New Testament, you can do it the same way. New Testament has old three nine. But in the New Testament, instead of uh, uh, adding, you you uh, you have a multiplier here. The cross is a multiplier. So you three times nine is what? Twenty-seven. And there's twenty-seven books in the New Testament. So you got thirty-nine old, twenty-seven new. Uh, and so to make up a sixty-six. Now, when you start looking at the New Testament, the New Testament is going to open up the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And uh, so if you were to think of it this way, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. The workman need not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. If there's a right way to divide the Bible, then there's a wrong way to divide the Bible. And most people wrongly divide it. Think about this. Let's say we was uh, going to take a job. Start in the morning at some... Uh, a trucking company, and um, they hand you, you're going to work in the office area, you're going to be answering the phones, and they hand you the staff manual. Now, in that employee manual is going to engulf what they do in maintenance, what they do in supervision, what they do in shipping, what they do in receiving, and what they do in the office, but it's going to be one manual. So you're going to have to sift through the manual and find your section because a lot of that section is going to be talking to somebody else. Right? That whole manual, shipping, is not going to have anything to do. Now, you're more than welcome to read and see what they do in shipping. You're more than welcome to read uh, what they do in receiving. You're welcome to read what they do in whatever. But your main focus is reading the manual for what is pertaining to the office work. The Bible is the same way. You've got one manual. But you have to remember, this Bible was written not only just for you. See, we have this thing in our mind we think the Bible, we're the center of the universe. And the Bible was written just for me. Well, that makes us feel all warm and fuzzy. But the Bible wasn't written just for you. It was written for Jews in the Old Testament. It could mean, it could be writing to Gentiles. It could be talking to the church of God. And so you're going to have to sift through the manual and figure out, now that doesn't mean you take what's to the Jew and rip it out and throw it away. That doesn't mean that. Uh, you can learn some stuff by reading what was written to the Jew or to the Gentile. But your main focus is to the church of God. And when I say church of God, I'm not talking about the denomination church of God. I'm talking about the church that belongs to God, preposition of. Now, with all of that said, we'll start, don't raise your hand and don't say nothing out loud. But if I ask you where the New Testament started, what would you say? Don't say anything out loud, don't raise your hand. But if, if, you, if you were asked, where does the New Testament start? What would you say? Do you know? Now, I know everybody in here is like, well, duh, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Hmm, maybe not. Think about this. Look at Hebrews. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews uh, chapter 9, I think. And let's find out where the New Testament starts. Hebrews chapter 9. Obviously, already you know the Old Testament is over here. And you got Genesis through Malachi. That is considered Old Testament. Uh, we've already went through Old Testament survey. No sense in doing all of that again. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 does. Because in your Bible, when you get done with Malachi, there's a page in the center that's that, you know, tells you the 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. Then when you open the title page of Matthew, it'll say, 
the New Testament or whatever. And we understand that by division. We understand all of that. But we're talking about doctrinally speaking. Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse number uh, 15. Now you definitely need to know this. Because somebody's going to ask you sometime uh, when the New Testament started. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 15. For this, and for this cause, he is the mediator, uh, medium, mediator, of the what? <coughs> that by means of what? For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, uh, they, which are called, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is... There must also of necessity be the death of the testator. You all see that? For a testament is a force after men are what? Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, so on and so forth. Now do you see, verse 16 and 17, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Y'all heard this. We read the last will and testament after somebody is dead. Let me ask you, by that verse right there, all those verses right there, when does the New Testament start? At the cross is where the New Testament starts. Because a testament is a force after men are dead. So when Jesus Christ says it is finished and he give up the ghost, the New Testament starts. You say, how is that possible? Okay, think about this. Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi. They're going to church on Saturday. Everybody with me? Uh, they're pork abstaining Jews, right? They, pull, they, they do not eat anything unclean. They go to church on Saturday. And when they do come to church on Saturday, they bring a sacrifice, a sacrificial lamb with them. Everybody with me? Okay. Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. When are they going to church? On Saturday. And they're abstaining from pork. And they're going to church on Saturday. They're abstaining from pork. And they are under the Old Testament law in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Everybody understand that? Just because Matthew 1-1 one, one starts, everybody don't wake up the next morning and go, Oh, we're saved by grace. Uh, Jesus hadn't died yet. You understand? The majority of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is in the Old Testament side I hope you get that. Because Jesus doesn't die until what? Matthew 27, Mark 15, <coughs> Luke, I don't remember, and John 19. So the majority of John, the majority of Luke, the majority of Mark and Matthew all are on the Old Testament side of the cross. Why? Because the New Testament doesn't start until somebody dies. And Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament. And it is a force after men are dead. That's where you'll get a lot of things straight back. Uh, is when you figure that out. Uh, now, when you're going through the Bible, <coughs> let's start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You ever wondered why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Think about this. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not this way. Um, it, it's not this way. Matthew, and then Mark picks up where Matthew leaves off, and then Luke picks up where Mark leaves off, and then John picks up and carries him to the cross. That is not the way Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is laid out. It's laid out like this. There are events going on at the same time. They'll tell you about the same events. Now, why? 
Did y'all know the feeding of the 5,000 is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? That's one of the only miracles that's recorded in all four Gospels. Now, why would you need Mark, uh, Matthew's perspective on it and Mark's and Luke's and John's? Same story. Just somebody tell the story and give all the details and move on to something else. You ever wondered that? Why do you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John telling the same old stories all the time? All right, think about this. If we were how, if we were going to be in art class and we would bring a person up here, we'd bring our uh, dearly beloved Tony Lawrence back there, we'd bring him up here, and we'd say, all right, we want you to build it from clay, or we want you to draw Tony Lawrence. Well, if he was to stand like this, y'all could draw him from one view. But eventually, you would have to turn him like this. Huh? <laughs> Tony would be like this. But anyway. And eventually, there are four sides. Now, some of you don't feel like laughing, and I understand. Hey, it's okay. There's four sides to a person. All right? If you want to portray Jesus Christ, you're going to have to look at it four different ways. Amen. From four different sides. Okay? Matthew looks at it one way. Mark looks at him one way. John looks at him another way. Now, all right, watch this. See if we can help you with this. Turn to uh, Revelation. To the right. Revelation <coughs> chapter uh, 4. Revelation chapter 4. And look at this. If you've been in the Revelation series on Sunday nights, you know some of what I'm fixing to tell you about those four <coughs> creatures that are around the throne. There are four creatures around the throne of God and they're crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come all the time. Look at Revelation chapter 4. And look about verse number 6. or 6, Revelation. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Sea of glass, that's a long, long way. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And, it, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a what? Lion. Second beast was like a what? Third beast was the face of a... Lion. And the fourth beast was like a flying... Eagle. Okay. Those four different characters around the throne. Watch this. John, or excuse me, Matthew. Matthew presents Jesus Christ as the king. What's the first image up there? Anybody ever seen the lion? Mark represents him as a servant. What's the second beast? A calf. A calf is the servant of the field. You would use a calf or an ox. Matter of fact, uh, Ezekiel calls him an ox. An ox, you would load him up and would plow the field as a servant. Matthew represents him as king. Mark represents him as servant. Luke represents him as the son of man. What's the fourth, or excuse me, the third image? The face of a what? Okay. And John represents him as the son of God. What's the fourth? The king is the beast of, or the king of the, of the, the field. The servant, the ox, the son of man, the face of a man, and the eagle, the flying eagle. He's the God of the sky. And those four creatures around the throne give you four dimensions of Jesus Christ. Matthew's going to show you the king. Mark's going to show you the servant. Luke's going to show you the son of man. You say, what's the difference in Son of Man and Son of God? Son of Man, all right, 
when Jesus was born, he was born of a virgin Mary. He was born as a man, just like you and I. But he was 100% God. That's why when at Lazarus' funeral, he cries at Lazarus' funeral. Why? Because he's the son of man. But he says, Lazarus come forth, and Lazarus comes forth because he's what? Son of God. There's two different sides to that. So you'll see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give you the four examples of what we're talking about. Now let me show you something real interesting. Um, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Uh, um, talking about Jesus Christ, look at Zechariah. Now after the Old Testament survey, you should know where Zechariah is. Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9. Old Schofield reference, 9. 73. Zechariah 9. Verse 9. 9, 9. Watch this. And this is the way the Bible does something. It's just interesting to me. It may not be to you. But Zechariah 9, 9. Everybody there? Read. You're not there yet? All right. 9.37, if you have an old school field. But this is what it says, Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shall, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold thy what? King. king. Behold thy king. All right? Look at Isaiah. That's back to your left. Isaiah. Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42. And I'm going to have to find this one. I thought I had it marked. Verse 1. It didn't take long. Isaiah, Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my what? <coughs> Zechariah said, Behold my king. Isaiah says, Behold my what? All right. Now, let's see if we can go back to Zechariah. It's toward the end of the Old Testament. I think. I can find it again. Go to Malachi, the very, very end, and then go back to the left. And Zechariah, about chapter 6. In verse 12, Zechariah 6, 12. Is everybody there now? Mm -hmm. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the what? Mm -hmm. Zechariah 9 says, Behold the king. Isaiah 42 says, Behold thy servant. Zechariah 6, 12 says, Behold the man. All right, look at Isaiah 40. Go back to Isaiah Y'all want to take a while to guess what it says? Yeah. And I thought I had that in one too. All right, hang on, take a look. Y'all see it? How much? Oh, there we go, verse 10. Thank you, Brother Jerry. Behold, the Lord what? All right, even in the Old Testament, they give you four views. Behold your king, behold your servant, behold the man, behold the Lord God. Four different views of the same person. You're, all right, you know in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden there was one river. Once that one river left the Garden of Eden, it split into, take a while, yes, four. Four. Jesus Christ in heaven, when he left heaven, he's one character. When he leaves heaven and comes down to this earth, he splits into four. All right? Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. 
show you this. Hebrews is toward the end of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10. And look at that verse uh, uh, 19. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which hath consecrated for us through the what? That is to say, his what? So the veil, now you remember we did the tabernacle deal in the Old Testament. There's a veil, four inches thick curtain before you get into the holy place. In the Old Testament, you could go in, well, the high priest could only go in there one time a year. Now watch. In the New Testament side, you don't have to go through a high priest. Jesus is our high priest. And you go through that veil. The Bible says, Hebrews 10 says, that veil is his flesh. So when he, Jesus Christ dies on the cross, the veil in the temple rent from top to bottom, laid open, and you will not believe. You won't guess in a million years. I'll give you the verse. We ain't got time to look at it. Exodus 26. Exodus 26 describes the veil in the temple. It's held up by four pillars. Four columns. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, his flesh. So that's, that's just the Bible. That's what the Bible does. Um, so, when you begin to look at all of that, uh, all right, let's look at, um, all right, let's look at this. Um, let me see. All right, let's, let's look at this. Okay. In Matthew, it starts with the birth. The birth of Jesus Christ. The wise men came after Jesus is born and says, Where is he born? King of the Jews. You have, if, to be a king, if he was going to be a king and sit him on the as uh, the throne of his father David and rule with a rod of iron, he has to prove his lineage, his birth. If you look at Matthew 1 1 sometime, you go back and it says the son of David, King David. So you've got the birth. All right? Mark. Guess what? You won't find the birth and Mark. Why? Nobody cares when a servant was born. So Mark don't write about it. Who cares when a servant was born? We do care when a king was born. Amen. Where does Mark start at the baptism? When he starts his <coughs> earthly ministry as a servant? Right. Now, Luke. Luke starts at the birth. Because Matthew gives you the lineage that traces back to King. Luke gives you another lineage that traces you back to all the way back to Adam. Adam, man. man. This one traces him back to King David. This one traces him back to Adam. So man. There's his flesh, there's his deed. And you won't believe this one. John. Where does John start? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Matthew starts at the birth, Mark starts at the baptism, Luke starts at the birth, and John starts plumb all the way before creation. Right. Because the Son of God has no beginning. You ever wonder, John starts out like Genesis. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning who? John 1-1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, the Word was God. Isn't that something? 
So now you've got four different views of the same person. That's why you've got, uh, all right, give me this one. Let me see. Uh, the ascension. We're not going to turn to all these verses because I really, I, I, gotta, I need to move on. The ascension. There is no ascension recorded in Matthew. Why? Because a king is not ascending. He's descending and going to sit on the throne. Um... Look at Mark. Well, we do need to look. look at Mark. Mark 16. No ascension in Matthew because a king is not going to ascend. He's going to descend and sit on the throne. Mark 16. Mark 16, 19, the ascension. Watch this. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord doing what? What's that word? Mark portrays him as a what? What does a servant do? What's an ox do? See? No ascension in, in Matthew. The king don't ascend. The ascension in Mark. Notice. Notice. He was received up. Right. It was as if somebody had to come down and pick him up. Because why? He's a servant. Alright? Look at uh, Luke. In the blue, 24. Let's see the ascension here. I'm just trying to show you something. Luke 24. Luke 24. And verse number 50. Or 50. Luke 24, 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. You see that? A son of man has to be received. Or excuse me, servant has to be received. Son of man has to be carried up. You know what? John, there is no ascension. Mentioned. You know why? He betrays him as what? Why does God need to ascend? He's already up there. You get it? Good. So Matthew represents him one way. When you read Mark, same story. Mark's going to give you a different twist and present him as a servant. Luke's going to give you a different twist and show him as a son of man. And then John's going to give you the son of God. There's multitudes of these. Multitudes of these that I could show you. Uh, did you know that um, the temptation, y'all remember the temptation where Jesus, or the, Jesus and the devil are, are tempted uh, in the wilderness 40 days? That's found in Matthew. A king can be tempted. He's got to be to see if he can sit on the throne. Uh, temptations in Mark. A, a servant can be tempted. The temptations in Luke. Son of man. Luke 4. No temptation is mentioned in John. Why? God cannot be... Isn't that wild? Um, baptism, same way. You've got the baptism in Matthew, the baptism in Mark, the baptism in Luke, no baptism in John. All through it. Uh, you'll have, um, anyway, I did a whole study on this on Wednesday night, and I have a series of uh, lessons on it. If you want the whole deal, I just give you just a little something. Um, all right, now, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
is all dealing with kingdom. All right, let me let me see if I can let me see if I can um, help you with this. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Most of that uh, is dealing with the law. Well, you have to understand. Look at Matthew 3. Look at Matthew 3 for a second. Let me show you something. Look at Matthew 3. Let me see if I can explain something. As Ricky Ricardo would say, let me see if I can explain something. Matthew 3 and verse... One. Three ones. Everybody ready? In those days came John the Baptist. Now let me pause and say something real quick. I know I say this at church, and our folks have heard it a million times. But let me just help you. John was did start the Baptist church. Okay? He was not the first Baptist. Well, he's John the Baptist. Yes. But he wasn't a Baptist because, but like, we're Baptists. They called John the Baptist because he was John the Baptist. Let me blow your mind just a little further. <laughs> Did you know John baptized on a total different reason than why we baptize? Right. Totally different. Right. Totally different. I'll prove my point. Watch this. Let's keep reading. In those days came John the baptizer, Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and here's his message, saying, Repent ye for the what? The kingdom, <coughs> the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, I want you to revert from the top line and go to this bottom line. Y'all see the bottom line? In Matthew 3, in Mark, in Luke, and in John. This right here was not in view. Nobody saw it. So the bottom line, because when John says, watch, he's standing right here before the create or before the cross, and he goes, Repent for the what? The kingdom of heaven is within reach. Is it hand? You understand? Right. They're preaching a kingdom message. Not a church message, because the church ain't in view yet. And I'm fixing to show you that. So pay, pay very close attention. The kingdom is at hand. Did you know what Jesus preached? Well, let's see what Jesus preached. John, uh, Matthew 4. Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent for the... What? Kingdom of heaven is at hand. Y'all see that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is all kingdom message. <clears throat> Watch this. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. Remember that? Mm -hmm. He says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. Can I help you? Can I help you? That ain't our prayer. I'm not praying for a king. I'm not Jewish. Right. Now, if you want to pray it every Sunday, you have to be sad. Knock yourself out. It won't hurt you, I don't guess. <coughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, where I just come from at the same coming. Does everybody see that? I know tradition, tradition, tradition. Well, blow tradition out your ears. And stick with the Bible. Well, we've always done it this way. Well, try doing it the Bible way. Amen. Thy kingdom come. He's teaching his disciples, which are Jews. Thy kingdom come. Now watch very carefully. Look at Matthew. Let me just show you right here. Matthew 10. This is an overview of the New Testament. Let me just show you this one. Matthew 10. Is everybody ready? 
Matthew 10 and verse 5. Get this one. See if this don't mess you up. Matthew 10 verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, Go not into the way of the who? Why? Hey, that's us. Jesus just told the disciples when they go out witnessing, don't knock on y'all's door. <laughs> go not the way of Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, which were half Jew, half Gentile. <laughs> Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of where? The house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the what? <laughs> Look at that. Disciples. Jesus hadn't died yet, right? right? Hadn't died yet. So that cross ain't there. Preach. Don't go in Gentile house. Why? Because you can't bring in a Jewish kingdom with a bunch of Gentiles. So don't go waste your time knocking on their door. Bypass their door, bypass the Samaritan door, and go strictly to Jews only. Right? And some of you are like, that ain't fair. Well, just hang on. You're fixing to get grafted in a minute. Hang on. Amen. All through the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Ready? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? Look at uh, John uh, 19. John 19. Y'all got to hurry. It's running out of time. John 19. And let's see. All right, y'all ready? Jesus comes to this earth and says, I want to be your Messiah. I want to be your king. You with me? I want to be your king. I want to be your Messiah. Right. Watch. Verse 14. John 19, 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. He said unto the Jews... Behold your what? Mm -hmm. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? Chief priest answered, We have no king, but we don't want that man to be our king. We've got Caesar. We don't want him. And they crucified the king. Watch, pay very close attention. When they crucified Jesus Christ, what this did is you take your hand and push this out. And now you've got the top line. You know what just got inserted? The Jews reject John 1 12. He came unto his own, his own what? His own Jewish family. And his Jewish family received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Amen. Even to them believe on his name. Amen. Now if you ever get a hold of that, you'll be able, you'll be able to straighten out all your friends. <laughs> they can't read the Bible except upside down. Now, now watch this. Came into his own, own received him not. Then after John, you've got the book of Acts. Now the book of Acts is a transition book. The book of Acts is going to... Alright. The book of Acts is going to transition you from law... To what? What do you got here? The book of Acts. It's going to take you from law to grace. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Real quick before we break. When Jesus dies on the cross... You with me? Jesus dies on the cross. He nails 
all the Old Testament law to the cross. Really? That means they don't have to go to church on Saturday no more. They go to church on Sunday. You're supposed to. They don't have to pork abstain anymore. They can eat anything they want to because Jesus Christ just nailed all that stuff to the cross. Guess what? The day after Jesus dies on the cross, guess what they're still doing? Still going to church on Saturday? Still pork abstaining? Why? They don't know to do anything any different. Right. Right. So he gives us the book of Acts to transfer us. All right? Let me show you this one. Go to Acts 2. Oh, this will help you. <laughs> Let's see if we can... I need to take a break, but I can't stop right here. It would take me forever to get us back on the same wagon wheel. Acts 2. Look at 5. Acts 2, 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem what? Jews. Uh, verse 14. Peter standing up with the what? Eleven what? Jews. And he said unto them, Ye men of who? Judea. What are they? And all they that dwell in where? Bunch of what? So Jesus, Peter is preaching all of this stuff. Look at verse 22. Ye men of... Y'all see that? All right, so Paul, Peter gets done preaching. You with me? Verse 37. Now when they heard this, when they heard this sermon, they, who's the they, were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, which are who? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Y'all see that? We've heard your message, Peter. Now, what shall we do corporately as a nation? Because the nation of Israel crucified Jesus. Now watch, very carefully. Acts 2 says, nationally, corporately, what must we do? Bunch of Jews. Because we crucified the Messiah. What should we do? You know what he told them? Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many of you have ever heard that verse right there quoted? For your salvation. <laughs> we just read 42 verses of Jews. You men of Judea. Jerusalem. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. <laughs> the whole nation of Israel. What must we as a nation of Israel do? Now watch very carefully. I know some of you get bored with this because you've already heard it. Some of these haven't heard it yet. I'm hoping they're getting it. Acts 2. We do. What must we do? All right, you've got Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 6, Acts 7, Stephen. Stephen says, would y'all please, nation of Israel, would you please? They pick up rocks and stones, Stephen. Acts 7. You will not believe this. You won't believe it in a million years. Acts 7, they stoned Stephen. God says, okay, y'all want it that way? That's fine. That's what it means in that Greek. Acts 8, an Ethiopian eunuch gets saved. Right. And that's something. Oh, watch this. <coughs> Acts 9. Saul gets saved, changed his name to Paul. That's going to be important here in just a second. Acts 10. Cornelius gets saved, and he is a Gentile. 
Well, hold the phone. Hang on. We're going. Let's fast forward real quick because some of you got break time on your mind. Watch this one. Turn to Acts 16. Acts 16. Look at verse 25. Real quick. Acts 25. Excuse me. Acts 16. 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, sang praises unto God. The prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had all fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas, in jail. The Philippian jailer is a Gentile. Right. Philippian, Philippian, he's a Gentile. Verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Y'all see that? So we done moved from we, the nation of Israel, to everybody in this room as an individual. And your salvation is not in Acts 2.38, I guarantee you. I don't care what I, they do. Your salvation is a Gentile salvation, Acts 16, 30, 31, 30. Well, 31 says, Sirs, what must I do? I ain't worried about a nation. I'm worried about me. And Paul, watch. Peter says to the nation of Israel, Repent, be baptized, everyone, in the name of Jesus. You got to be baptized, Jesus' name only. Y'all heard that? Yeah. <laughs> now, watch this. Paul in Acts 16 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be what? What's the difference? Acts 2 is we, Israel. Acts 16 is me as an individual, Gentile. Why didn't Peter and Paul say the same thing? Why didn't Paul say, well, you know Peter told them Jews back there, that you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ only. He was going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Da, da, da. Why didn't he say that? Because they was talking to two different groups of people. Can anybody read anymore? It says what must we do as a nation. That's Jewish. Then you've got to repent be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus. Paul says, hey Philippian jailer, I know you're a Gentile like everybody in this room is. What must I do, me, be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. Boom. There's a difference. We'll drop the mic right there and we'll go to break. <laughs>